Okay, good. So let's make it big screen. Uh, so like I said, uh, my name is Kumsolo uh, uh, <clears throat> Don't worry about if you uh, have a hard time pronouncing my name. I've heard a lot of versions of it. Um, feel free. I won't be offended. Um, <clears throat> a bit of about me. I did web development for uh, more than 15 years, both in Turkey and Canada. Um, so over time, I got really tired of doing web development. And the uh, for me, it boiled down to taking user information and submitting to databases. It didn't matter if this was Facebook or Twitter, because I kind of think the whole web experience is basically data submission which became boring after 15 years. So I thought solving game development problems might be much more interesting. And after I found myself unemployed um, in July, 2020, I decided that it was actually time to start my company. So I uh, uh, created Wired Games. Um, I decided to release a game to, to see how the whole uh, self-publishing would work. Since then, I've been working on a farming uh, farming simulation game called Urban Farmer. The project uh, is quite big and uh, it needed funding. So in the meantime, uh, I thought I would also do some other uh, stuff on the side. Uh, so last September, I was approached by Pack Publishing, and they asked me to write a game development book, which is the topic of uh, tonight's presentation. Uh, by the way, I also organized Godot Toronto. If uh, you guys are interested in learning uh, about Godot, uh, the, the time zone is a bit weird, maybe, because we meet at 7, uh, usually the first Thursday of every month. So it might be a little bit late for your time zone. Uh, but sometimes when we have presentations, we try to record them too, and they might be available. Um, so that's another avenue for you to uh, learn Godot. Um, also, um, you will probably uh, find two types of people uh, either saying Godot or Godot or different versions of this. Uh, I think officially they, the uh, creator of the creators of the software, I think they settled on um, Godot, but you will still find a lot of people say Godot. Uh, that's also perfectly fine too, um, the controversy there. So tonight's agenda, uh, I'm gonna cover uh, a few chapters of my book. I'll try to keep it relevant to the group. Um, so assuming, uh, most people here are already okay or familiar with um, uh, creating models and textures and uh, you know the 3D workflow with Blender. Um, so I'm gonna start in chapter six. So now that we have models, uh, well, how do we, uh, you know, reconcile all these models with the with the game engine? Um, and so this involves making the models ready and then exporting them. Then of course we have to look at, look at the um, importing process. And once the assets are important, we are going to create uh, usable game objects. Uh, that's one thing that is sort of different between uh, Blender and Godot. In Blender, your work is uh, most aesthetic. And I'm not talking about animation. You could animate your models in Blender, but uh, they don't really interact with the, there is no world, no uh, sort of game uh, mechanics in that sense. So uh, a game engine makes your models interact with each other in a sense. So we'll look at that. And to make things looking uh, more appealing, we'll, uh, we'll investigate how to adjust lights and environments. So, um, so let's say you created models and you got to a certain point that you feel your models are ready, uh, but like ready in the sense that they look beautiful. Um, the game engine uh, may have a different opinion about the, the readiness level. So there are usually four uh, things you have to be careful about. So this is not necessarily an order of importance, but um, um, 
let's just go in this order. So you may end up with uh, what is called in the industry an angon, meaning um, um, you will have the number of vertices making a face so that like you will have more than four vertices making a face. And I think for this, uh, I'll go and uh, show some files to use to use. Let's see. This is in chapter six, I said, okay. This is when I, I am showing my uh, lack of familiarity with Zoom. So, okay, hang on, there you go. So let's open this uh, Blender file. Um, so Angon is basically a generic name uh, for any type of uh, geometry that has more than uh, four uh, vertices. Here we have the uh, we have a pentagon, but this could be any any kind of uh, known uh, angle. So the problem here is um, if you look at this uh, statistics part, uh, there is only one face that is uh, the result of five vertices. Um, here is uh, where this this could be problematic. Um, of course, this is an isolated case. Uh, it looks such a simple geometry. But if you put enough of these vertices and if you have a game character, and most game characters will have uh, body parts that are bending, you will have uh, walking cycles, that kind of thing. So when the um, vertices and the geometry is bending around certain points, um, this sort of uh, face um, will will be processed by by your uh, GPU, um, your graphics card, and the GPU will try to break this uh, face down so that it actually has uh, triangles. So here's a, uh, a manual way of creating triangles. So like this is the simplest way to create proper faces out of this pentagon. Now we have a triangle and a quad. So this is an accepted geometry. Um, sometimes your graphics card may took the liberty to divide it this way. This is acceptable too, but if the remaining uh, vertices and the way uh, these, uh, let's say, edges are flowing, it may create unwanted results. So if your model is going to be used in animations, uh, you got to be careful about not leaving any uh, angles. So there's a bit of cleaning up process. Uh, if you're not going to animate your model, you could get away with uh, leaving angles. So then you could have pentagons, hexagons, and any kind of like combination. It may still look horrible, but it will pass the test of the GPU and the game engine. So this is one thing uh, you got to keep in mind. So here you, you see the other combinations. And this could quickly turn into a, uh, a math problem. Like how many times can you divide a pentagon to create maybe two or three faces, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, another common thing that uh, you will deal with is setting origin points. Um, I think this is something most Blender users come across when they are animating uh, because uh, when you want to animate something, uh, you will want to rotate or scale your objects around an origin point, or sometimes I hear it's a pivot. So this is especially important uh, for game engines because all the physics and the calculations are uh, done according to this point. So I'll show an example. So these um, two barrels, Besides their co color, uh, they look the same and they, they have the same proportion, but uh, I'm gonna select both and sort of move the camera this way. This um, yellow one, the origin uh, is at the bottom and this one is uh, in the, uh, let's say center of gravity. It's uh, volume wise right in the middle. So when rotation is going to be uh, 
applied to this red barrel, it's going to uh, turn around that uh, origin. So if you do this, it's going to rot rot uh, rotate around that. But here, um, this is sort of like you know uh, connecting with with ground. You may actually take this a step further and say, well, what if I want to apply force from the right side and this barrel is going to tilt and then be knocked over this way? Then you will have to move your pivot point here so you can apply the proper transformation. Um, that's why the decision on this is there's no golden rule. Kind of is, uh, you know, it depends on the situation. Um, but it's something that you have to keep in mind. Um, because either one will work. The angles might cause a problem, but this is uh, not exactly a problem. This is more of a kind of like whether you like it or not, or if it's the right uh, uh, application. Uh, it looks uh, more natural to the eye. Um, we have another um, uh, case here with the rotation and scale. So like rotation kind of matters here with the origin points, but this is a different kind of rotation problem here. And I'm going to show a different file for that. And, uh, so again, besides uh, colors, uh, these cubes look the same. Uh, I'm gonna select the green one. And I'm just gonna let you read the properties here. Um, maybe more specifically dimensions, uh, four meters on each uh, axis. And then the red one is also four meters too. Indeed, to our eyes, they both look the same size. However, uh, the, the red one is four meters as a result of scaled up like by two. So it, it's as if this was two meters on each side, but was scaled up to, to get to four meters. The other one is at its original scale, but it's the same dimensions. So this is a big difference uh, when it uh, is imported into game engines. This is not uh, exactly a Godot engine problem. Most engines are sensitive to this sort of uh, behavior or uh, this, this sort of uh, value, uh, sort of, you know, different values being different. And here we have another problematic case. Um, visually, uh, they kind of look the same, uh, but this one has has, has been rotated uh, 90 degrees around its z-axis. So a typical problem of or outcome of this uh, issue might be if you are building a, a human character, um, so you will want the character's face to be aligned with a certain axis, let's say it's it's y or x direction. Um, it may it it may not matter to you because like well, what difference does it make if it's facing y or x? And again, it it may still not matter which way you set it up, but uh, you have to make sure that the, this value is zero there. So luckily, there's an easy fix for that. Uh, you press Control A and you, and you'll choose rotation and scale. Uh, this value will not change. And um, well, this looks the same. It's not actually rotating a uh, different way, but now these two cubes are considered the same. So the red one is actually safe to be imported into Godot. Um, I'm gonna close a few screens here. Last thing in our uh, list of making models ready is the export format. Um, I don't know if there are uh, people in the group who uh, have experience with Unity. Um, usually the, the format that Unity people prefer is FTX file format. Uh, in Godot, uh, a different file format, uh, G GLTF is preferred. Uh, Maybe I'll actually open one of these again. Um, let's pretend, actually, the other one is probably better. This one. 
Um, let's pretend we want to export one of these uh, guys. So yellow barrel is selected. And here's your export option, GLTF. Um, so this is where you, you may sort of get lost a bit. Uh, that's why I'll do my best to explain what's going on. Um, so it, again, uh, for the sake of uh, brevity, I cannot explain every single thing here tonight. Uh, that's why there's a book and you can read more about it. Um, but essentially, uh, if you have a lot of objects in your scene, this option may matter so that you are not exporting camera and light to Godot. Um, this is something you'll never touch, most likely. Uh, but uh, why that might be, uh, like if you don't know anything about it, it might be tempting to turn it off. Uh, in, the Z axis in Blender is the uh, the height axis, let's say. But in, in Godot, uh, plus Y is the uh, up axis. So this is making sure that once it's imported into Godot, uh, the proper orientation will be maintained. Uh, you'll never expand this and bother with that. Uh, most likely this, this part, as I said, is uh, needed. Uh, geometry and animation. Um, if your file, if like if your model doesn't have any, any animation applied, selecting this will not do anything extra. So, this is also something that maybe you won't worry about most of the time. If you do have animation, then you might be a bit more uh, careful about what you are selecting here. The more advanced animation case you have, uh, you, you can customize your export options here. Most of the time, uh, this geometry part is important. And I'm gonna talk about this in more detail. Uh, I might be actually bleeding into the next slide. Let me check. Yeah, we'll get to that part. Um, so when you're exporting your models, uh, you can also export the materials. These materials are the materials that you are uh, defining here. Um, this is not a limitation between Blender and Godot. Un uh, universally, there is no standard pipeline between uh, 3D uh, software and game engines, meaning um, the material that you will be creating in Maya, Blender, or any other 3D authoring application, uh, you cannot 100% uh, transfer to any game engine. Uh, I don't, there is no such thing in the industry as, a, as an exchange format. Uh, a lot of these formats come close, but some things you still have to complete it in your game engine. But this uh, option does its best. So whatever material you have in Blender, try to export it. So then Godot will try to take them over. If your materials have images, meaning textures applied, it will also maintain them. Uh, automatic in this case is um, um, Blender supports different image formats. So it will try to keep the original image format or otherwise it's gonna to try to convert them all to JPEG. So these two options, you, you won't touch them most of the time. And uh, this is a relatively new option. Um, this is an advanced thing, um, but as most of you know, I'm guessing that like people here are using the principled uh, shader in uh, Blender. So this is respecting more of its uh, properties. Um, again, this just makes it a bit closer to the to what you see here, uh, or the exported result will be as close as what you see here. Uh, this is an important option. Um, when you have modifiers applied, um, and I th I prefer it a lot actually. I, I don't like to model every single vertex. Um, if you don't choose this, um, if you start with a cube and you have 10 modifiers applied, uh, it will export it as just a bare bone type cube. Um, so remember to apply this. The rest uh, is by default uh, on because you, you want to export the UVs and normals so the textures can be mapped properly. And also vertex course is important um, because um, 
maybe if we have time, I'll discuss some shader uh, stuff. Uh, this is again important. Uh, these loose edges and points, um, sometimes I see in tutorials that uh, while using Blender, people create uh, just the vertex or just an edge. Uh, they are not part of uh, the the overall geometry. They are kind of, in a sense, like loose. They just sit there. So these two options are also maintaining uh, loose uh, structures. So when you export uh, your files, uh, it's going to be uh, the the file extension will be GLB, even though the file format is called GLTF. Um, uh, again, for completeness sake, I'm going to expand this area, show you the options. So all three options will start with GLTF. Uh, the default one binary is uh, what you should keep. This is compressing all the data. It's the smallest file size. Uh, this is when you have the definition file plus uh, some, like the, the, in the bin file, you have uh, some extra stuff and the textures are uh, a separate. Uh, entity. So this is when you want to separate things. Uh, this is a really advanced case. You, you won't bother. And uh, this is, again, like there's really no reason for, for you to choose this in case you feel confused. Because I hear that, um, well, you should use GLTF. Well, it's tempting to choose the last one because the file extension says GLTF. But really, uh, like GLB is, is just fine. So choose the binary option. And uh, because I already have assets exported, I'm just going to hit cancel here. Um, I actually usually uh, tend to have the questions uh, near the end of the presentation, but uh, if you have questions up until this point, uh, I'm happy to answer. I feel like uh, your question might be answered in the next few minutes. I'll say so and then skip it for that reason. Um, I'm trying to see the chat screen. Let me pull it up. Well, it's possibly the wrong screen. Are there any questions? Uh, maybe someone can tell me. Because I'm having a hard time finding the chat screen. Uh, no questions so far in the in the okay. chats. Good. Okay. Um, back to the slides. So we exported stuff. Now it's time to import. Uh, let's go back to the uh, agenda. This is the uh, chapter seven uh, of, of the book, uh, which actually covers the importing. Um, uh, audio files as well, but I'm keeping it relevant to the group tonight. So let's worry about uh, just the Blender parts, not the audio files. And for that, I think I'm going to have to. So I'm going to show my folder structure here for chapter seven. Uh, I take the user. The user is, um, starts the chapter with the start folder, basically. And uh, there are a few GLB assets uh, uh, exported from Blender. Uh, Windows users, uh, I don't know if this exists in uh, Mac, but uh, Windows has uh, a 3D viewer, which lets you preview GLB files. So this was a file in Blender and uh, is exported. So. Uh, can actually see the uh, wireframe structure too. So let's uh, try to import this into Godot. Um, by the way, the first time you launch Godot, let's also show that too. So, um, there's going to be this uh, goofy robot uh, icon. If you launch it, um, this kind of uh, like selective project sort of like repository list. Uh, it doesn't look fancy. Uh, I must admit other game engines have more fancy logos and such. Um, this one is simple. So 
Um, I'm going to create this folder and this is how our project starts. So this is the uh, engine itself. Um, sometimes I hear people, this has so many familiar looking features uh, to Unity. Uh, I stopped using Unity a few years ago. I don't know if the interface has changed, but uh, essentially most game engines will have uh, a 3D um, viewport, uh, which is indicated by this press 3D. Uh, you could also switch the 2D workflow. And uh, this is something that doesn't exist in Unity. If you want to write your script, you usually use an external editor. Uh, most people use Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code. So they write their C sharp code, they come back to Unity, hit the uh, play button and play. Uh, Godot, on the other end, has its own built in script uh, or text editor, uh, which brings you all the documentation and such. So uh, this takes you to the online docs, but the same online docs could also be uh, reached here within the engine. Um, so this is. Uh, sort of a brief view of the engine um, but let's say a few more words here's your file system this is where we'll import our stuff or when we import it you'll be able to check it here this is your scene tree we'll construct our scene uh, by creating uh, engine specific structures and when you click one of these structures you'll be inspecting them for their properties here so it's a very simple workflow. And um, into this project folder, um, I will now go and uh, put some stuff. So this is the project that I just created. Uh, there's an icon PNG, uh, which is also what you see here, and default environment, uh, some resource file. Again, uh, not relevant but this is sort of one-to-one -one view. So what you can do now is, uh, let's pull this aside. I'm gonna try to find the other uh, file here. So let's import these three files uh, in here. And uh, let's be organized and let's call them models. So now we, if, when we switch to Godot, uh, you will see this um, uh, progress uh, pop-up, which is uh, processing uh, the uh, files. Now, you see a lot more than three files that I copied and pasted, uh, but what we should focus on um, is basically are these three files. These are the files that I uh, pushed into this folder. If you remember that during the export options, uh, like on that export options screen, I chose to include material. And these are the materials that were exported from Blender and Godot uh, separated them. Um, and I'm just going to click one of them and you can see uh, the properties. This uh, looks very similar to uh, PBR shader or principal shader in Blender. Again, there is no 100% match, but uh, it's close enough. Uh, I don't think it's called Albedo in Blender. I forgot the name. I think it's just called color or base color. But all the other properties, you have them. Uh, the metallic specular workflow and roughness. Uh, you could either have normal map or a separate uh, height map, which is labeled as depth. So some names are close enough. Um, again, you could read the documentation to find those uh, differences. It supports multiple UV, uh, which means that you could have your normal textures applied to your material and for decals and uh, other sort of overlaid material, you could use a separate UV. Um, uh, I think one thing that the game engine does for you on top of or I don't want to say as opposed to because I don't know 100%, but uh, you could chain um, uh, materials or shaders. So although this is a green material, 
I could be assigning another material and that material will have its own next pass. So I could be kind of infinitely as much as the memory allows me. I could be applying many other materials and chaining them. So that's where you get out of sort of a static blended environment into more dynamic changing uh, game engine sort of workflow. Uh, this could be creating a lot of cool effects, but it could get uh, quickly complicated too. So going back to our slides, at this point, um, you might be concerned about workflow. Uh, maybe not in the first weeks, even months, if you are like learning Godot, but eventually you will find yourself uh, in a position where like, okay, so I have models, which is GLB file like here, but I have a lot of materials here. It's going to be a nightmare to find your way around. So inside models, you could be having maybe a sconce folder. You could just drop the sconce GLB in that folder. Then that folder will only have that uh, sconce uh, models materials. But then what if we use the same material for different models in Blender? And maybe your workflow, you thought, well, you could be uh, picking colors uh, as labels for your uh, materials. Uh, like maybe for you, dark green means this. Maybe light green is a lighter version of the screen. Uh, that's why um, you will have kind of workflow considerations here. Um, it's sort of impractical for me to show each case here. Uh, I did my best in the book, which was difficult enough, but uh, here, here I'll kind of discuss, like instead of showing, I'll maybe tell you. Um, so one way is labeling your blender materials by purpose, uh, meaning um, if it's uh, a sword, maybe uh, you just say, okay, this is the blade material, but there's also hilt. Uh, if you have different sort of like uh, distinct sections of your model, you could uh, label them by the purpose that like, part of the model uh, serves. That's one way which then may lead to duplication because, well, what if the steel sort of gray uh, specular, so like you prepare some material, what if another metallic surface has the same properties, but it's a completely different shape, it's a different design, maybe it's a bucket. That's when you will have duplicate materials properties wise with separate names. So the, the steel, sword steel will be the same as bucket, but then it will be exported as two uh, different materials. Um, one way to prevent that is to go by color. By color, I mean uh, I mean the uh, hexadecimal color or the RGBA color. So that you know your albedo is always uh, a, like a distinct uh, green color or red color. And uh, maybe you create variations of that. So you, you come up with a naming structure it's some hexadecimal code dash, maybe uh, you will have two or three numbers that indicate the metallic, metallic specular roughness, really, that sort of thing. Um, so that may be a solution. Also, separating your, uh, importing your models into separate folders might be uh, a useful thing. Um, this might be actually uh, enhanced. Uh, uh, like a step further, uh, if you find yourself like having a lot of folders here, but dark green is, uh, it, you know, if it exists in multiple folders, maybe you will want to extract it to a higher level folder. And then a lot of uh, these models will be sharing that. So and again, that's something that maybe you will be concerned about later on. Uh, it's not something maybe most beginners will worry about. The only problem is uh, in your, like the overwriting might be the problem here. That's why I'm talking about this because in Blender, if you uh, if you choose dark green for two different models, 
But in one model, really the, the color code of that dark green material is different. So then which dark green is going to be exploited? One will overwrite the other one. So that's when you, you may want to separate into folders or come up with a smart uh, naming convention. Um, staging area is another flavor of this. Uh, this is if, like someone just bets what is coming in, what is coming out, and uh, there's a person separating this uh, accordingly. It could be you. Um, so we just saw the uh, importing uh, materials, but um, let me see. Uh, we're not going to make a scene yet. So importing animations. So we have sconce, which is a static model. Vessel is, if I recall, this was just a simple uh, receptacle, something like this. Right? Yeah. Uh, Neither the scones nor this uh, vessel, uh, they don't have animations, uh, but I think snake does. Uh, this uh, snake uh, has this idle uh, animation. Um, okay, animation one, animation two. In animation, okay, so this is the idle one and this is uh, the attack one. I think sometimes Windows uh, loses the label and uh, does a reverse order. Um, about this, uh, what I have to say is, um, I may not have that file here. So in Blender, this is something that I can show. When you create your animations, uh, I don't have any here. But uh, you could label your actions. There's a way to uh, label your actions. Please do so because otherwise you will have some like bizarre names. Uh, I think uh, Blender by default puts it like new action one, new action two. Th those won't be helping you. So uh, on that note, uh, it's actually very uh, typical to start with a cube and just, you know, have it and then you just keep creating. But things here will always look like cubes, spheres, you know, they're sort of like a basic geometry name. Uh, when you export your stuff, it, it will be super important to label the, at least the highest uh, level. So you can uh, find them easily in Godot. Otherwise, uh, when you import them into your, uh, uh, into your scene here, uh, you will actually see cube cylinder and a lot of weird names and you, you won't find your way around. So let's make a scene uh, out of scones. And uh, this is uh, a way to uh, create a scene. Uh, so we just said, we double click the uh, GLB file here in the file system and um, you have the uh, item here. Uh, displayed. Um, as you can see, this must have been the origin point in uh, Blender. So it actually understands and puts it in the world center. Uh, that's why I was emphasizing the origin point. So uh, maybe it makes sense to put the origin point here or here. If this thing is going to lean forward and I don't know, like break off the wall, that kind of thing. Depends on your use case. Um, this uh, sconce is um, in Blender. Uh, I think I have that file. Maybe I can open that. There you go. So this is the collection. Um, it doesn't have a name, but when we export it, uh, that's where you can kind of get away with some like naming conventions. Uh, we export this scrums because it on all uh, it had two basic structures here. It uh, carried these uh, structures over to Godot, so that you have base and flame, and you have the base and flame uh, imported here. That's when that uh, scene tree in Blender and the naming convention. Uh, it's not always. It's not a hard rule to name every single thing. Uh, but if it's going to help you do so. So, uh, so these two structures are mesh instances as they are named in uh, Godot. 
uh, which is assigned uh, a mesh. So this is your geometry in Blender. And when we click, um, so you see some details and I'm expanding the surface. Um, sometimes meshes are complicated. It may have multiple surface, but in this case, this is a kind of a, like just one simple structure. Uh, this is similar to having a geometry in Blender and you will choose certain faces and assign a material and some other faces of that same object will have a different material. This is the same idea. You could have multiple surfaces in that sense and each surface will have its own material. This is basically one-to-one. -one. And here is the material uh, properties. Uh, here, this material preview is... Um, kind of shoved into this area. But if you want to analyze this by itself, uh, this is coming from model spire material. You could double click and uh, then the whole uh, inspector will be populated with that materials properties. It may be helpful sometimes because uh, sometimes this list may grow too long. Uh, but the changes that you'll be making here is as if you individually open the material in the inspector. And here's where naming conventions or the export options might be crucial. If you decide to have a different uh, color for the base or maybe a different flame color. So what are your options? So you can do some of these changes in Godot, but if it's drastic changes, especially if the mesh is changing, you will have to go back to Blender. Um, because uh, you won't be able to edit uh, vertex information in Godot. There are ways to do that, but it's painful. And chances are, if someone changes it here, uh, your team member will go back to Blender one day. They will do something without knowing that you have updated it here, or that person may very well be you. So keep things uh, like the you know maintain one source of truth. So go and change it in Blender and then kind of repeat and like rinse and repeat. Uh, when you overwrite the GLV file, the changes will be automatically picked up and reflected here. Uh, with a few sort of edge cases, if you are changing material references, uh, if this uh, flame uh, was applied a fire material, but has a sort of like hot fire material because it looks more yellow than orange. Uh, then uh, this fire material won't be deleted from Godot, but a new hot fire material will be put next to it. So to keep this area clean, like I said, some of these uh, practices, uh, it's something that you have to figure out. Uh, it's about your workflow. Uh, so this is essentially how you make a scene. And uh, when you make enough of these scenes and put them together, you could design a level, which is our next uh, slide. So here uh, is an example of a floor piece. Um, this is similar to how I constructed a sconce. So double clicking the GRV file, this is uh, its own scene. And then, uh, I'm actually going to open some of these. Uh, don't worry, I'm just uh, kind of showing the the uh, you know bulk of the workflow. You could compose scenes in other scenes. So here we have a scene that is uh, uh, composing two scenes that actually are the floor tiles. So if you put enough floor tiles and a few other structures that are vertical, maybe some props, uh, then Sooner or later, you will have uh, this level. Um, however, uh, in this case, um, something is missing, which is this uh, last picture here, the uh, body of water. Um, how do you export water from Blender? Uh, you kind of don't because there is no such thing as water model in Blender either. That is usually done by shaders. So it's usually a plane uh, subdivided and you end up moving uh, the vertices of that uh, plane up and down, you know, there's some noise pattern. So that's exactly what you do in Godot here. You write a custom shader to change a plane 
so that it actually looks like water. Um, you have a few exceptions like that, uh, not exceptions, but sort of like you cannot directly import from Blender because it's not something you could export. It doesn't make much sense. Uh, but otherwise, uh, do your stuff in Blender. Make sure you have no angles. Uh, origin point is set correctly. The scale and rotation is applied. Export to GLB. Uh, double click, create a scene, create bigger scenes. Uh, let's say water is extra, maybe you don't want to have water. Um, so what is actually missing here is, well, it looks gray. Um, so this is a Blender render, if possible. Uh, if like, we could uh, make our scene look more like this, and it is actually possible to do so. Um, although we imported a sconce model, we could, and we also have candle models. Uh, um, they are just vertices, so we still have to create our own lighting system in Godot. And that is also possible. I'll actually uh, look into these files very soon. I just want to finish these uh, sort of the slides. So here um, we have the candle model itself, but we are also putting a light object in the game engine. So uh, this is called OmniLight, which is the equivalent of point light in Blender. Uh, Blender has uh, sunlight, which is called directional light in Godot. There is no such thing as area light. And there's one more uh, light type, uh, spotlight. I think there is one to one called spotlight. That, that's the only one I think that has the same name. So. The reason why um, I sometimes insist on creating individual scenes for models, and this is not something you have to do for every single model, but you will often find yourself in a situation like this. If I'm going to have multiple candles uh, distributed around my level, instead of pushing individual models around the scene, if I have a, a candle scene, which has a light object, light object, if I create instances of that uh, candle object, then each uh, candle will bring its own light object. So that will save me from moving one candle model here, positioning a light object, and doing that for every single one. So they are going to be self-contained units. And um, uh, these two are somewhat advanced. Uh, I'm looking at my time. Uh, I'll just say a word about this. Uh, maybe if we have time, I'll show it. Um, so when you enable the lights, um, you can change the, uh, like you can apply post-processing effects, which will turn this uh, still gray looking and somewhat like lit screen to this like, okay, this is kind of like a cave environment. We, we will have dark, uh, dark spots and even darker spots. And uh, finally apply global illumination. I hope uh, the difference, the uh, the uh, the benefit is coming across. So this is an image split here in the in the middle. So the left one is without global illumination. So there is a crate here, and shadow is cast on 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 this wall here. And there is the like half of a door arch door here. It's hard to see. When you turn on uh, global illumination, you see some part of the door, at least this arch is more pronounced and the shadows are more soft and more uh, believable. Like um, here, uh, this area is closer to the light source. This area is uh, like there's more distance. It makes sense to have a darker spot here than here. You lose that nuance on the left side. So global illumination uh, is, uh, Essentially, this is your step towards uh, simulating what you maybe create in Blender. So there are ways to uh, have a prototype in Blender and you know, come closer and closer to what you were planning to build. So now I will try to uh, go and open some of those uh, steps. So in the book, uh, 
the creating level is chapter nine, um, which is essentially a blank, blank canvas. And we have models. And these are all the models that the, the, uh, the reader will use. And some textures, there's only one. So at the end of this chapter, uh, this is where we end up with uh, chapter nine finish. Because it would take too long, I'm not showing you this step, but uh, this you see a finished result uh, for each chapter. So creating scenes and composing scenes in other scenes. So I'm gonna expand, sorry, I'm gonna actually do uh, collapse all here. Uh, I'm not sure if it did actually. Okay, I'll do it manually. <laughs> Maybe my computer is taxed right now. Um, so you could have a you could have a very big scene, but yeah, you could organize your way around. Um, and this is what I said about the uh, water shader. This is basically a plane with um, shader applied. I'm trying to find the material most likely here. Uh, you could write your own code to create a shader. Uh, this is something that I ended up writing. There is no like water shader uh, in Godot, but it's actually just 10 lines of code, which is using a, a noise pattern. And there's some parameters here. Uh, you choose the color and the height, which actually changes the, uh, the uh, uh, oscillation. Um, everything else, as I said, is uh, just objects distributed around. And after you finish this level building, um, chapter nine's finish basically becomes chapter 10's start. So you start there, uh, you build on, and you enable lights and shadow. And this is where you end up with. So now, um, by this point, the uh, global illumination, I believe, is enabled. It is here, uh, in, in here. Um, and you could also be uh, maybe asking yourself this question, well, OK, we have the candles, sconces, but does that mean the lights will always be on? Well, it kind of is, but if you write a little bit of code, you could do something like uh, trying to find where the sconce is. Let's select this. Um, I prepared this object so that it actually has a property. I say, well, is this lit? Yes. And I say, well, turn it off then. So it, it goes off. Uh, you could do a few tricks like this. Uh, now, this may seem like something that actually helps you while you are constructing the level. But this is kind of where you get into the game development. Well, this thing that I'm doing to help myself build the, the, the level, what if I give my player a way to, to turn you know, on these lights? Maybe there's going to be some kind of like proximity. Maybe uh, your player character will be, your game character will be approaching a certain spot with a torch in their hand. That's when you... Uh, check your condition and say, okay, now it's time to turn on and it will actually come to life. Um, this is where you really transition from uh, manually doing things in Blender because you use maybe animation timeline. That's still a manual approach. Here is, uh, you, you are now in the interactive realm. Um, so that's what I might say between like, well, I'm gonna be always working with models, shaders, in a sense, uh, the workflow is different, the end result is different. Uh, although Blender is uh, quite exciting to use, uh, working with a game engine always feels more dynamic than uh, using Blender. So one is more static, the other one is more dynamic in terms of comparison. Because um, sometimes I get to hear questions like, well, aren't both doing the same thing? No, they are not. Uh, they are complementing each other in a sense. Um, I'm just checking my time. I think now might be a good time for me to stop and get your questions uh, because I may decide to show up different parts based on your questions instead of taking that liberty.
and maybe showing things that you may not be interested in. So go ahead. Uh, t thanks for that. So lovely presentation. So Very first good. question I have is where can we find your book? Uh, the book is uh, on Amazon, I think on all Amazons. Uh, so Canada, uh, United States, and I think uh, UK as well. Uh, so I did not actually link it, did I? Actually, maybe I linked it here. I linked it to the uh, com. Cool. Uh, yeah. Would you be able to put that in the in the chat for us? Sure. I think uh, if, if not, I can do it uh, for you. I think I'll change this to the UK address. And you have to find the chat screen. Maybe if you stop sharing, it, uh, it yeah, appears. It okay. Or while I'm sharing, okay, I found the chat screen. There you go. Ah, thank okay, you. Good. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, thanks again for that. It was a lovely presentation. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if any other people have some questions for uh, for our speaker. <clears throat> yeah, actually, I, I've got one. Um, I'm sorry, it's very specific to me, I think, probably. But um, it, it looks absolutely fascinating. Uh, and I have a specific... A possible need for it, no need, maybe not. In that, I'm doing a a website on uh, about one of the medieval wars in UK called okay. the Wars of the Roses, and I want to create sort of um, battle scenes which are a bit more realistic than the normal things you get on a you know blocks of of soldiers moving around. It, you, it, so it's not a game, but it, it's a kind of um, it would be a, a I don't know, you've got it really, a, a demonstration or whatever. Okay. Do you think Godot would be appropriate? Oh, and the other thing is, if you do something in Godot, can you then convert that so that you can show it in a website? Or definitely, maybe? definitely. Oh, um, great. So Godot has HTML5 export. So uh, if you're familiar with that technology, it's using yep. WebGL. So okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, you could export it to uh, HTML in that sense. However, I don't know the scope of your project, but uh, if you're using a lot of, sort of explosions, like, I don't no, know. It, no, it, it wouldn't be like a, a, a full simulation. Yeah. So show, I, it's about the, over time how people moved around, really. That, that's... Yeah, it's about the limitations of uh, like a web browser at that point. If you yeah, sure. run it as a desktop application, then uh, I guess yeah, the performance will go like you know will be better, uh, but it is quite possible. In fact, I'll actually show the export options instead of telling. <laughs> so these are all the options you can use. Okay. Uh, so the HTML5 I mentioned, you could be doing the mobile formats. Yeah. Uh, Mac OS is possible, but uh, you always need a Mac to export to Mac anyway. But I mean, regardless, you could export it. Um, these two um, are Windows applications. Uh, so uh, this is more like a sort of mobile mobile app for Windows platform. Okay. I believe I might be wrong, but I think that's what they intend to do with that. And of course, Linux. So it um, it doesn't support consoles yet. And that's not a technical issue. That's a licensing issue. Okay. I think powers that be didn't really or they don't give kind of permission to Godot to implement console export. They are just not legally uh, able to do it. Okay. And most of the time, as a game developer, you have to uh, meet either Xbox or um, Sony. Like you have to sit down and agree. Um, like they will be your publisher, so you have to come to an agreement, and they will send you a developer kit, and. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to be part of their program. So th there's more legal stuff going on than just technically <laughs> hitting a button. So um, I'm saying this because sometimes a lot of people uh, see that the consoles are missing and they just dismiss this engine because like, it's no good. It's not exploring to console. It's not because it can't, but it just kind of wants for <laughs> legal reasons. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And by the way, I'm really into 
uh, Middle Ages stuff. So oh, great. <laughs> I'd be excited to see your work. <clears throat> well, eventually, maybe I'll get around to it if I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. Um, <clears throat> so, any more? Are there any more questions? I may just add one thing while maybe questions are still being formulated. Uh, the programming language in Godot is, is uh, basically this. Uh, it's called GDScript. I'm enlarging the font a bit. Uh, you, could, you could also use C Sharp. It supports it. Uh, however, GDScript is uh, easier to learn. It kind of resembles Python. There are sort of C influences. And the, the, the whole light switch is basically as short as this. Uh, we are just checking if it's false or not, and we are turning the visibility of a game object. Um, this is a very simple case, but uh, at least it's a taste for people uh, to see what, what is involved in the programming. Maybe a question. I'm also checking the chat. Uh, it uh, looks quiet. In case anyone's talking, I think you've blown everybody away. I see. Oh, here we go. Uh, <laughs> is so, a performance issue with the choice of language used? Is that the question you are seeing too? Yeah. Okay. Um, I haven't tried C sharp long enough to answer the question properly. Uh, I'm guessing that question entails that whether we should use GDScript or C Sharp. Uh, I heard from uh, tests that C Sharp uh, runs faster in uh, the DAO. However, this is usually what's advised. Uh, most of the time, if your programming involves simple things like this, uh, maybe reading a file, uh, which takes only a few lines to like read a file, take the content, and like make it available to your other game systems. Writing that kind of like C sharp code is quite painful. It's it, because it's a different mindset. Like you you create file streams and pointers. This like I'm exaggerating, but it takes a lot more effort to do simple things. That's where a game engine makes things easy for you. So for most ordinary things. Uh, use GDScript, but where you want to be really performant, uh, maybe have like a AI layer where you will have a lot of computational things. Then you could also have C Sharp in the same project. So these two scripts could run side by side. Mm -hmm. And uh, they just talk to the uh, behind the scenes sort of game engine structure. So we could be requesting uh, in your GD script code, something that C sharp code is doing somewhere else, and they, they will just communicate with each other. So it so the performance issues then are going away. Because sometimes when people just look at the bulk numbers, like C sharp is super performant, uh, let's just ditch GD script. But what happened to developer experience? If it takes me like twice as long to write the same kind of code, I don't want that either, because you know production timelines, deadlines, whatever. Uh, it's possible <laughs> to be strategic. I hope that answered your question. Because I, I think I may be answering a question. It may not be the um, <laughs> answer you are seeking or satisfies you. I'm just trying to make sure. <clears throat> Um, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I, I think I kind of got one question out of interest. Um, I mean, I don't know Godot um, really at all. Um, I did hear on the news recently that Godot, I believe it's removing, is it visual scripting? Um, yes. From the engine. Is that a, a problem for you? Or what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, uh, is that kind of puts me off a little bit? Not really. Uh, but for me, it's not a problem because I've been programming since early 2000s. I would much rather write code than uh, visual scripting is like in Blender, we don't write code to create shaders. We use uh, a node system. So it's convenient yeah. to drag and drop uh, nodes to each other. 
So Visual Script in Godot is essentially the same. Writing uh, code like that is okay for beginners. Uh, maybe it's easy to visualize, but it becomes like very quickly like inconvenient and like you have to look at a very large map of like what's going on here. And like if I'm going to find this variable, if I click, double click it, it's highlighted everywhere. Uh, I can just do copy replace, sorry, uh, like find and replace, uh, add another condition here. It becomes very difficult to maintain after a while if you do the same thing with usual script. Um, I, I don't think the node system in Blender grows so big that it's a problem. But any kind of visual like node system is, I I believe deep down has the same problem. It's just that I don't think this is something most people notice in Blender, uh, because uh, the the scope in the end is still limited. Like uh, I don't think it's maybe there is a, a shade, Blender shader or like out there that actually has like one thousand nodes, but I, I doubt that. <laughs> But it could quickly grow to thousands of nodes in in Godot. Yeah, that's good so point. that I, well, that's a workflow problem. The uh, the team that maintained Visual Script they thought their effort would be uh, spent better elsewhere. Uh, that's why it's, uh, they are dropping. Uh, so that's the sh that's sort of right. like a short answer. Yeah, still long. Oh, I think. Thank you. You're welcome.